Something started to stir inside me. I hadn't been home to the res in several years, and I knew it was time and that this time would be different. I wanted to meet with Robert Forstar, the chief of my tribe. I know there are stories that need to be told so that the old ways are not lost and forgotten. When we arrived in Wolf Point, he looked at me and said, I knew you were coming. My Indian name is Wihinapawea. In my language, that means rising sun woman. I was raised by my grandparents on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in northeastern Montana as a member of the Red Bottom Clan. And when I tell most people that I am part of Cinnaboyne, they say they've never heard of us. My culture has always stayed with me, even though Los Angeles is my home now, far from my people and my native land. These are stories from some of the people back home. And there are more stories than these, for sure. I come home to the reservation to get filled up. I get filled up with the medicine of the land, the joy and the pride of the Indian people. Because these Assiniboine people don't share who they are and where they came from and their, our culture with people, people uh, believe whatever it is they read and what they hear. I speak to so many people who really have no understanding of what a reservation is, uh, what a modern day Indian is, and the diversity of people from white to Indians, mixed, mixed breeds. It was challenging to be a white mixed girl raised in an Indian household. Yet I felt the um, embrace of the Indian people in my, um, in my elders. It isn't like the movies portray us. The culture is rich on this reservation. We have uh, two sets of people living here, Cinnaboins, Wadopanan, Red Bottom, two bands of Cinnaboins here. Uh, we have our, our Sioux relatives that live on the other side of the, the creek, Thule Creek, on this reservation. What traditions do you think are most misunderstood? All of them. Every one of them. My name is Robert Forstar. That's the English name I go by. The last name Forstar came from my great great grandfather. He was the first Forstar. He was a man of the roots, which all the Red Bottom people are. The word uh, we are Hude Shabina. Hude Sha means Red Root people. Hude Shabina means the, the people who, are, who deal with the red roots, that's who we are. My, my dad had a lot more teachers than I do today. You know, we, we've lost a lot of elders here and, and a lot of ceremonies. And how we live today isn't how we used to live back in the, back in the day. Hello, my name is Uses Mini Eagle Tail Feathers. I'm an Assiniboine from Fort Peck. Because we went to public school, my mother wanted us to fit in, so she made us get baptized in the Catholic Church. But we did that for, for not for ourselves, but we did that for, we thought, the white people that we live amongst. I was raised going to church until after the war. Then we become Indians. A long time ago, before the coming of the European people, when a young man 
grew of age, they became involved with warrior societies. It was within these warrior societies that the history of the tribe was kept, the language, the tradition, the discipline, the value system that was passed on to our younger children. It was their school. We had no schools back then, we had no books. All history books say that the Assiniboines are a part of the Great Sioux Nation. Our language is classified as a Siouxian language. That's the story that is printed in the history books, so everybody says these Assiniboine people are descendants of the Sioux people, and that's not so. One of the things that's very important among Indian people is language. And language is very important to our ceremonies. Language is what gives our people their identity. It makes them who they are. There are very few people that speak it very fluently anymore. And to try to instill that into our, our children in this day is really, really tough because they've already been they've already been taught how to live like a white person, but they have no knowledge of identifying with who they really are. But when I was a young boy growing up, my mother, she told me, she said, you're gonna live in two worlds when you grow up, she said. So try to get yourself a really good education, she said, and go to college if you can, she said, so you'll be able to live in a white man's world and get a job and be successful, she said. But on the other side, she said, you also live in our Indian world, she said. So learn the best you can your language, she said. And learn the traditions of your people, she said. And the things that they mean, she said, because that's who you are, she said. That's what makes you an Assiniboine. Once you become an Assiniboine, once you find yourself, as my son was saying, you don't need to know anymore, you don't want to know anymore. We teach this culture and we share it, and if they want to learn it, it's theirs. We pretty much cease to exist if we, we don't live the way we were taught as First Nations people. You look at this way of life, it's, it's all waka, it's all holy. These uh, ways of our people are very powerful and very strong. Unfortunately, a lot of our young people are not learning these ways, but there are a lot of them that are learning. The way our people believe every child has a song in them, but it's up to them to find that. In order to find that song, you need to tune yourself up. And a lot of our people are out of tune right now. So as you're working, tune in yourself up culturally, spiritually, mentally, physically, understanding yourself. You're tuning yourself up and soon you're gonna become in line and you're gonna be able to hear the tree, their song, the sky, the stars, the moon. So you're gonna hear their songs, they're gonna sing them to you. And once you tune in, once you have that harmony with these things and you're in harmony with all things, then your song is gonna come to you. When your song comes to you, you'll know your purpose of why you're here. And everybody has a song. The one job that I have in my whole life that I cherish most of all, and the one whole purpose I have in life is to carry the medicine lodge for the Assiniboine people here, the canoe paddler band of Assiniboines. There's 13 moons in a year. We follow those religiously. After the 13th moon, uh, within a several days of full moon, we build a lodge. The ceremony is a ceremony about life to prove not to me or not to the other people in the ceremony. It's a walk that they walk between themselves and God. 
behind me is the lodge that we built this year. Our medicine lodge. For me, it's a very important part of my life. In our Assiniboine way, when we put up our lodges for ceremonies, and our door is always faced to the south. South is the direction to the spirit world. The ceremony itself doesn't um, isn't isn't only for Assiniboines. It's for any Indians that want that want to be a Assiniboine. Because you, when you come here and you participate and you live this life, it's because it's it's more than just coming to be a, to a ceremony. It's coming to learn how to live your life. And when you come and you learn how to live your life with us, you become one of our people. The culture of not only the Assiniboine, but of all traditional people is very, very rich. There's millions of things to understand out there. And I was told as a young boy that you could live to be 120 years old and you'll still never know everything there is to know about our, our way of life and about our people. can't read a book and try to understand something or somebody. You can only get a little bit of insight. You have to live it. There's more to life than just one weekend. There's more to life than just a sweat. Some people go and they sweat and they think, no, I've got everything. It's not so. You can go somewhere and you can see everyone doing a certain type of ceremony, but if no one knows what they mean or why they're doing it, and they're only doing it because their ancestors said that was the way to do it, there is no power there. The lightning coming from the Thunderbird, that lightning is what connects the sky and the ground. Thunderbird, that is the one that comes from the west and he brings us life. Okay, uh, I was asked to sing one of our original uh, honor songs that we still keep alive. It's called uh, Old Man Archdale Song. He was at Fort Union when it was first opened in 1832. And if you go to it now, it's about a half a mile from the river. But at the time it was built, it was on the north bank of the Missouri River. And Fort Union was the first European settlement out here. It was built for trade with the uh, Assiniboine and the Cree people. In this song, he said, the Assiniboine culture is having a difficult time. We're having a tough time. That's what, that's what the words of this song are. So I'll sing that song for you, if I got a voice at all. Hey, ah, hey, ah. I'm known as Johnny Bearcup Stiffarm. My uh, real name is Hungawash Dewia, which means good chief woman. When my mother had me um, and had me at the hospital and brought me home, we were living with my maternal grandparents and in our traditional way, the firstborn grandchild always goes to the maternal grandparents. And so my grandparents took me and they raised me. Ceremonies were an integral part of our lives. We went to Canada, and um, I grew up like that, and I believed and felt strongly in my heart that all Indian children were being raised like that. I didn't realize until I got a lot older that many of my cousins and many of my friends were never raised like that. So I was very lucky. I don't have to dress Indian or act Indian or worry about it the way I see so many people doing today because I know who I am and no one can take that away from me that is with deep within my identity. And that's who I will always be. Of anything that, has, that makes the Cinnaboines uh, the people that we are, it's the religion that we have. And this, the Medicine Lodge is the core of our religion. 
when I start this fire, it burns until we're done. The first day of the ceremony, we, um, we sing all night. We put up a double teepee. The lodge maker and his helpers go out while the singers are singing their songs. And they line up to two stars at the end of the Big Dipper. And they find the North Star, which is north. And they know where south is, which is the way to the spirit world. On the second day at daylight, we'd get four of our bravest men, and I send them out to find the center of our universe during the ceremony, which is that forked pole that we carve. And they go and they find a pole that is like our people. It's going to be strong, it's going to be straight, and it's going to be nearly perfect. And they cut everything by hand, and they build the lodge. By the time the sun goes down, we have to be done with it. We stand that pole up and we open the universe up to God. He comes in there and he listens to our people. On that pole that we carve, on the south side is a red road. And it's a, it's a strip cut into the bark that we paint red. And that red road signifies the walk that our people take. It's the red road of life. And it's a long road that extends from the earth mother to the sky. At the end of that road is a rainbow that we carve. And that signifies the the good life that if you walk on this red road, at the, in your walk, you'll, you will end up at the rainbow. The rainbow uh, which would be the good life that you have. On the opposite side of the pole, we carve a thunderbird. And the thunderbird is the giver of life. And the thunderbird, the story we say, doesn't pity any, any people at all doesn't pity our people, doesn't pity any people. Years ago, when families raised their kids and they went and visited people, what would the kids do when their parents were visiting? You know, to tell you the truth, the kids could sit by you and be quiet. They don't say nothing. You could take them to an Indian dance. Like the celebration I went to, why are those kids running back and forth all the when they're having a contest dance or something? Not in our days, those kids sat still. We don't visit anymore. People were always visiting at our house. They come in talking and, and the rules of the house, when adults are in the house visiting, the children go outside. How did you discipline your kids? I was strict with them, but we made them work. <laughs> do, you, do you think that kids now have too much freedom? Yes, they do. Well, I don't think it's so much the young people you want to talk to, it's the parents of the children. Because if you're going to instill culture in somebody, it should be like my granddaughter. She's two years old. She's lived in that since she was brought into our household, and that's all she knows. And uh, there's a lot of lost young ones here on this reservation. We took a look at the attendance. We took a look at the tardies. We, we took a look at everything. And we, we, took, we went back for about 10 years. And in 10 years, out of 67 students, it's roughly, we got a small school, but out of those 67 students, a third of them are already dead. I was taught that an elder is not defined by the age that someone is, although many people today say that. When I was a young person, an elder had a different type of meaning. It meant that someone who was older, not in age, but older in wisdom and understanding. This person that has the spirit of an elder could be a lot younger than me. 
if they had extraordinary empathy and they understood people and they were able to give sage advice, they were highly respected for that. What's your English name? Gladys Jackson. What's your Assiniboine name? Tatil Bawakami. Medicine Door. style of dance there's a story the uh, chicken dance you got the jingle dress dance but uh, originally the grass dancers were like special ops young men and they would go out and they would, they would go and uh, sneak and peek on enemy camps so he would get as close as he could and all the while moving with the wind and moving with the grass around him and he would count how many teepees how many elderly, maybe how many horses, and then he would sneak back. So as he got back, men would ask him, how many, how many warriors, how many horses? That young boy would tell him, good, they said, and they would put this young boy on a horse and they'd bring him back to the camp. We don't doctor people during the dark side of the moon. The dark side of the moon is during new moon, when you can't see the moon. We don't doctor animals, we don't doctor people, because all of their energy and all of their power and everything that we have, our spirit, has went down from our head back down into the earth. And so it's hard to heal people on the dark side of the moon. When I was a little girl about the age, I want to say six, I found out that my grandpa Tug had um, terminal cancer. And the doctor said it was incurable and he was going to die within a year. So he didn't bother with white man's medicine anymore. And he came out to his relations uh, house out here. And his name was Fred Archdale. And he was a, a healer of the Archdale family. And I begged to come with him. And my grandmother would say, that's, that's not our ways, you better stay here. But I begged my grandpa when he would come to these healings. And so the rules were I had to stay in the back seat. And he would go in and he would bring things. I wouldn't see what he was bringing. And I'd listen to the rattles and I'd hear these songs and there'd be long pauses. And for me, it was the first point in my life where I knew there was a medicine that was beyond anything I had been taught or known. When they show you a ceremony to remove something from somebody or take a terrible illness from somebody, when it works, it's not you doing it. It's your grandfather I always say that. You always tell the people, it's not me. Mm -hmm. It's not this medicine, it's grandpa. Mm -hmm. And there's some of our people say, you're a diabetic, you're taking Indian health pills, you stop taking those when you go to school. We don't think that way. If you're taking those pills, you continue to do that until you don't need to take them anymore. They're looking out for your health too, even though they're not Indians. So we have respect for that also. There's all kinds of stuff for medicine plants all over that boost your immunity, that will help you. Uh, if you get thirsty, you roll a little bit up, up and you stick it underneath your tongue, it'll help you help you. It'll medicate you so that you don't get sick. And we use it, um, we also use it too much to cleanse ourselves. It's a silver sage, I believe. We just call it sage. This is the main sage. It grows single, single stranded. Well. purpose in life is balance and that I'm full of good and bad 
the most powerful thing and the, the most harm I can ever do to anybody is in what I say. Because I could stab you with a knife. After a couple of years, it's going to heal up. You're even going to forgot I stabbed you. If I say something mean to you, you'll remember that the rest of your life. When I got older, I understood what a lawyer was, and I decided that's what I wanted to be. And uh, that wasn't my first choice. When I graduated from the eighth grade, I had a teacher who asked me what I wanted to be, and I said I wanted to be a ballerina like Maria Tallchief. They laughed and said, you can't be that. Pick something else. So I said, okay, I want to be an astronaut because I love science fiction and I love space. And they told me, you're not smart enough to be an astronaut. You have to be really good at math and everything else. They said, you know, you really should become a secretary or you could become a nurse or a nurse's aide. And I said, I don't want to be any of those things. So I'm going to be what I think would be helpful. I think I'm going to be a lawyer. And the teacher looked at me and she said, you're never going to be a lawyer. People that come from places like this reservation can't be things like that. And that's where I got the inspiration to prove them wrong. As Assiniboines, we're very fortunate we have even an astronaut out there who's an Assiniboine. We have people who own banks. We have some wealthy people. There's attorneys, and we have attorneys out there. And they all come back for our lodges in the springtime. And, and it's amazing, these people who are super wealthy are the speakers of our language. They chose to do that, what they're doing, and the Creator has taken care of them. I know from history that back in the early 1800s and 1700s, our people were still using dogs for transportation and using our feet. So somewhere in the early 1800s, we either acquired the horses uh, from the Crow or from the Blackfeet, and that we either acquired them through stealing them or through trading with them. I do know my family member uh, was killed uh, stealing horses from the Blackfeet in the uh, late 1800s. And horses were a valuable commodity. And so people that may have had lots of horses would be willing to trade horses for, for probably for a woman, for a wife. Because women were, you, were, were, were most likely in a nomadic society in our history, were the workhorses in the family. They were the ones that did the, all of the daily chores of keeping a family together. He's our newest one, he's uh, the biggest bull. They need me after the present. <laughs> culture to the reservation. So a group of people got together and we was able to purchase our first 40 buffalo. And it was grown ever since. I was made uh, chief of the Red Bottom in June of 1981. 
the uh, they approached me first of all in uh, 1965 when I came back from the military service on leave to visit my parents. Went in there, there was about 47 elders all sitting in there from Fort Belknap and Fort Peck. And my uncle Otto, Otto Cantrell, uh, Chief Bluebird, was running the pipe and he said, we're going to smoke this pipe and pass it around. You men smoke it and you women can only touch the stem of this pipe. And when we get done, we're going to come to each one of you and ask you, do you think my nephew should be the chief of the Red Bottom? And if one of you says no, it won't go through. And all 47 of them said yes. So now we got to have a name. And I said, that's up to my mother. I said, she's, uh, she's the keeper of our knowledge. And so she said, okay, his name will be Chief Buffalo Stops four times and we'll have the ceremony publicly out there. I believe the chief, all the traditional chief does is be sure that the culture stays alive. The culture is shared with the people. There's no authority there as being a chief. My English name is Joseph Miller Jr. The name that I carry among our people is Tatango Ohidi Gesa. And the uh, translation in English is uh, the buffalo that is always brave. I never say that I'm a chief. I never say that I'm chief of the Wadupuna band. And the reason for that is because I feel that it's for the people to say that, not me. I don't have an Indian name. I may not dance Indian or parts of Sundance, but I'm Indian. Being Indian is here. It's part of life. I've got a long history of activism. I've served on the tribal council for 2003 to 2005. The responsibility we have as elected officials, it's not just a job, it's, it's a, a matter of survival of the people themselves and our land base. We're the ones with the land base. Treaty responsibility, we have such a tremendous responsibility to protect that. Did you vote in this election? Yes, all the time. How'd you feel about Obama winning president? I think it's time. It was it was a long time in coming, and I I was hoping it would have been a woman. I so I do. I do vote. I think it's a it's a good thing to do. When we were very young, we used to go to these meetings of our elders, and they would sit around this big wood stove and they would talk and they'd drink coffee or they'd drink tea. And they would talk about our treaties and all the promises that were made to us. And we met all the different lawyers that came in at that time because we had a whole series of different lawyers. And we would listen to them. And I always believed that the only lawyers that existed were these old white men. And I always was very interested in why everyone would want to listen to these old men who came from far away to talk to us about things. And why we couldn't do and work our way through the system ourselves and why we always had to have someone to translate what these people meant and that the English words they used did not ha have the same meaning as the English words we used even though we said the same thing. Politics is very much a part of everything. It, it makes the world go round, but we need to introduce in this world positive politics. We are at the Wolf Point Catholic Hamburger Stand and um, about to eat a Catholic burger. There you go. Hello. Just looking at it. We'll bless it from the Pope. <laughs> the Wolf Point Stampede started. Who started that? The Indians. The Indians started that. And they had their horses in a big pasture down here. They had to drive them in. But it was all Indian cattle. And some of those horses were Wild. Montana. Tonight 
tonight's kind of a special night that's part of the whole package of the Stampede, and it's the street dance. When everybody comes from the Stampede grounds, this place is going to be going off. Not a lot has changed since I've left the reservation. The houses are the same. We have cell phones. Unlike living in the metropolis, technology hasn't broken nature. It makes me feel peaceful. Although the life was richer when I was a child, this was a booming town, a town filled with possibility. In taking a look at our reservation today and the way it was in 1951, we began to really have the oil boom and there was money on this reservation and a lot of changes happened and occurred. We also had several wars going on and so when you have war, you know, that's uh, really a boost to the economy. So we had a &S tribal industries that was doing really well. We were a defense contractor. We had a lot of people working. There was a lot of money on this reservation. And then all of a sudden, everything just kind of went kaput. And Dr. Butte, whenever you're ready, enter tribal. Thank you, thank you. You know, one of the really interesting things people ask us a lot about is our sacred dog ceremonies. We use a puppy for a variety of things. One of the things we use them for is naming. In Indian, they, they say the day you're born, there's the way you're gonna die at the end. And some Indian names give you a long life. And we also need the name so that when we die and when we go to the other side, God knows who his, who his calling. Naming of our people is very important because when we talk to the spirits in the spirit world, they know us by our Indian names. When we name babies, we always ask them to uh, come wearing moccasins. And as we name the child, we remove a moccasin from the child and we take a knife or some sharp object and poke a hole in the bottom of the sole of the moccasin. And we tell the spirits that this child has a hole in this moccasin and it cannot travel, it cannot walk very far. It's a way of protecting the young child that the spirits see that he has a hole in his moccasin and he can't travel, he can't go no place. So he has to stay here with his parents on this earth. It was a great honor to raise these puppies for ceremony and ritual um, because I knew that these were sacred messengers, that they were carrying the message of the name, the true name of a person or they were going to carry a message to the other side, to the relatives who had died before, to let them know a beloved relative was coming. And another time that we use the puppy in our ceremonies is during a death. When someone has died, we usually have that at the four-day feast. Among our people, we believe that when the person dies, that their spirit wanders this earth for four days, going to all the places that they like, the people that they loved, and just taking one last good look at this world. And on the fourth day, we hold a ceremony. So on that fourth day, early in the morning, once again before the day breaks, they're supposed to take these young pups and they pray with them, and they tell them it's their time that they need to take this message to the next world. So is it legal to get buried anywhere you want out here? Oh yeah, yeah. As long as you own the property. If you own the land, you can. Mm -hmm. Mom and Dad's behind the log house there. Oh really? Yeah, that's Mom down the grave. I fear nothing. There's nothing I fear on this earth. You know where you're going to go. You welcome. I shouldn't say it that way, but you welcome the end when they when they take you. You have no more worries anymore.
pretty amazing out here, isn't it? Just like a good place to be buried. And so you'll you'll hear some places that my house is haunted. My children are scared. The spirits that leave the body. There's a term we use, Waninja. They said the person died, Waninja. That Waninja doesn't mean the person died. Waninja means the spirit taken on another form. Our belief is that when the spirit departs that body, for four days your spirit roams this earth wherever your, your, your body went. And on the morning of the fourth day at daybreak, they take your spirit back to the spirit world. Most of the reasons a spirit never gets a spirit world is because they didn't live the life here that they were supposed to. There's a lot of spirits from wandering this earth that never got to the spirit world. And then there's a mourning period, they say, for 12 months to ease your mind of all the experiences you had with that person. So in 12 months, you call that spirit back from the spirit world. That's a ceremony that you have. Your descendants down here, well, they'll gather gifts and they'll share them with people, the visitors they bring in and they'll cook the meals that you like to eat when you was here. They sing the songs to call the spirit, to eat with everybody that's there one last time, to see that everybody is happy and everybody is laughing so that spirit won't want to stay in this dimension, but rather it's willing to go to the other side. Your spirit from the spirit world sees all the things you're doing, sees all the people that are in this, in this room for the ceremony. And then when that's all over with, you tell that spirit you're gonna go home now. And you, perform the rest of the ceremony, and that spirit goes back to the spirit world, never to come back again. I want to go to college. If I can't do that, maybe enlist in the service. I have a lot of talent. You know, I don't want to waste that, just throw it away. I started running, and they bought kindergarten, first grade. My dad ran. Jay Brew Sr., he ran, and that's how I started to get into running. And People always tell me I have the talent, and I think I do if I just, just keep my head up and don't have to li don't listen to all the negative stuff that people say. A lot of jealousy around here. It's hard to it's hard to have good talent and have somebody not be jealous of you and put you down. But nothing's gonna bring me down. Whenever I go, when I set my goals, when I run, when I play music, when I make art. I always have the reservation at heart because the reservation gave me a strength and a quality of essence to persevere that I, I couldn't have got anywhere else. You won't starve to death here because there's so many family and friends. But if we try to leave, there wouldn't be anybody. You'd be all, completely all on your own. I went away. I became successful. I passed the bar, I became a lawyer. I worked in a big city and I survived. I'm doing very well in my profession. It's difficult to come back in this culture. It's difficult because there's values you have to live every day. It's not just play Indian today. It's every day. You have to do it every day. It was very hard emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually when I was in law school. Law school was really traumatic. It was a very much of a culture shock for me. Um, I was very afraid when I was there. I was afraid to succeed and I was very afraid to fail. And I remember when I got ready to go to my exam in Colorado, when I went to go past the bar, I took a thermos of tea because we always drink tea and it reminded me of my grandparents. I took a bunch of chocolate because I love chocolate. And I took my eagle feathers and my sweet grass and my sage and I made an altar all around me. And I prayed that no matter what would happen, that the spirits of my ancestors would be with me. And I didn't pray to pass the bar. What I prayed for is I prayed that they could comfort me. First time I didn't pass the bar when I took the test, but the second time I did. You know, my family that stayed behind, when I left my family, I, I think they were happy for me. They were proud because they knew I was gonna get some experiences that I would never get here. You know, I think people knew I'd always come home. 
But people always ask me, why did I come home? You had everything you wanted out there in the city. Why did you come home? I think I came home because my heart told me and my spirit told me it was time for me to come back. Giving back means not just throwing money to your community, but giving back means being accessible or showing the possibilities of what can exist there. It's always home, regardless of how long you stay away or how many miles you are away. You know that this is home and you can always come back. But it's nice to know that you can always leave too. <laughs> You know, generally, as I've observed, I've really, I have so many questions about life that uh, that are unanswered, and, and it's an ever quest for for information, forever. You know, I love science fiction, so I'm always thinking about all these different things, and I always wonder how my tribe will be able to survive a thousand years from now. Because I think a hundred years, you're still going to be able to find someone that's going to look at documentaries like this one. You can find someone that's going to look at old books and read about our stories and our legends. Um, but I tell people, you know, where's today's hero? I don't want a hero that is nothing but dust and bones. I want a modern day American Indian hero. I was Indian when Indian wasn't cool. And so you, what you see in Indian country, as I travel around, is people who are cultural, they adopt you right away. They want you as part of their family. But traditional people, you'll know them when you get, you get to a, a, a region where there's Indians, they'll notice, they'll see you right away, they'll know you. It's, it's a lot of fun being an Indian. But it's also very difficult because they expect things of you that if we're going to use technology and we're going to use every possible thing that we can find in today's world to give our young people of the future a handle on who they are, we need to explain what those symbols symbolize, what they mean. Why do you carve these things on the center pole? because that's the way grandpa always did it. Why do you have a moon there? Because that's what they always put it. That's not the answers that we need to have anymore. If there was one thing that you wanted to say to people in 50 years, Joe Miller, what would it be? Teach your children about these ways so that these things will continue and they will not die out. And when I offer up my pipe, I say, I'm gonna pray my way, you pray your way. Help me, let's do it together. I remember one time one of my uncles told me, he said, stand still and then start turning in a circle. Within that circle, he said, you will find everything that you need to live. Not about money, status. Most of the time, it's just the simple things, he said. But as we look around here, we see everything that the Creator has given to us. And so I would tell my grandchildren, be good to people, share things with people, love one another, learn to help people, and do things for people and don't tell nobody about it. Just help them without asking nothing in return because many good things will come to you. <laughs>